the co-founder and former CEO of Foursquare, joins us to talk about his new project, how to make the internet fun again, and his thoughts on the latest tech news from AI to mixed reality. You don't want to miss this one. All that and more coming up right after this. Welcome to Big Technology Podcast, a show for cool-headed, nuanced conversation of the tech world and beyond. We have a great show for you today. We have a legendary New York founder and also uh, someone who's going to introduce a new product that he's working on, which is very exciting for us here today. Um, I won't take up any more time in the intro. Dennis Crowley, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me on the pod. Really excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for being here. So let's just kind of talk about the state of Foursquare, because I think the meme is that it, you know, it was big for a number of years. It's like 15 years old at this point. And yeah, 14, I think. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's now it's two apps. There's Foursquare city reviews, I think. And then there's the swarm app where you can check in. Yeah. And I think there's a view that, it, you know, it had its moment. Now it's kind of dormant. It's, you know, talked in it's, uh, it's moved into ad tech, right? There's been some location services that Foursquare has provided, but I think it's kind of murky after that. So I've, I checked the app store today. Both those apps have updated within the past three months, so it's still active. But tell us a little bit about the Foursquare uh, story arc and where we are today. Yeah, I mean, we we started Foursquare in 2009, and now it's 2024. So that's like, is that like 15 years? I mean, I can't do the math. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I was CEO of the company for six years. I, I no longer work there. It's not my day job, but, you know, I remain on the on the board. Uh, and I'm an active participant in board discussions and strategy, strategy discussions, right? But I think that the story of the company often gets framed through the apps. Like, yeah, we still have these two apps. They're still in the store. Uh, there's still millions of people that use them, but like, it's you know, obviously not what it was back in like 2012, 2013. But I mean, that's that's fine, right? Like the company's business is not based around the consumer apps. The company's business is, is based around this idea of... of um, you know, location technology, location intelligence, developer tools, um, you know, business analytics. Uh, we were, you know, we, we did, we were doing a lot of in the, you know, location advertising space. And as that space started to, you know, dismantle a bit, we've, we started to focus more on location analytics and location like, tools um, and technologies for, for third parties. And so like, you know, it's a, it's a good, stable, successful business. Company does you know, well north of a hundred million dollars a year in revenue. Um, you know, is it 300 plus employees, you know, maybe closing into 400 employees, you know, offices around the country. Um, so, I mean, it's a good, stable, solid business. Um, just a lot different than the Foursquare that many people know from, you know, call it 12, 15 years ago. Yeah, I think that would surprise a lot of people. 100 million in revenue a year. North. Yeah, what, wow. well north of that. And so, but yeah. I, I don't know what I'm allowed to say, so I'm going to just right. that. That's That's <laughs> very big. And... It was also like I was going on your LinkedIn and you kind of like give you the description of Foursquare and you say back in 2009, Foursquare made the check-in mainstream. And today those 13 plus billion check-ins are the foundation of our powerful proprietary pilgrim technology that helps make sense of where phones go for more than one, uh, 150,000 partners, including Uber, Tencent, Apple, Samsung, and Twitter. So basically from my understanding is Foursquare knows where people are because they've been checking in and you can sort of match like the Wi-Fi signal and the cell phone location. And so they've been like, there's been almost this human reinforcement, right? <laughs> of like where yeah, the technology think, thinks you are. And that's become a valuable service to these companies to figure out where people are. Yeah. I think the, like the original kind of big thing that we did was make this you know, crowdsource map of the world. Like the same way that Wikipedia is a crowdsource encyclopedia, like we made maybe the original crowdsource map of the world based upon you know, people checking into places and adding photos and updating things and a whole community of super users that were, you know, you know, tweaking things and updating the hours and updating location if it moves. And, you know, that, that worked really well when there were whatever, you know, 50 million people using the app. And it turns out that that still works pretty well when there's millions of people using it. We don't need tens of millions of people using it regularly in order to maintain that, maintain that data set. Um, and you know, like now we we routinely do partnerships with um, with third party sources, so that like you know, we take our crowdsource map of the world, and then we bring other people's data on top of it, and other people's data on top of that, and it helps us really like clean and normalize things. And it just turns out that it's like a really amazing data set. And then on top of that, like we used all that data to make this you know amazing technology. Which originally used to be called the Pilgrim SDK, now it's called the the Movement SDK. 
And this is like a little piece of software, like an engine that you can you know, put on your iPhone or Android device. And it makes your device, you know, kind of conscious of, of where it is, right? Am I moving? Am I stopped? Okay, I'm stopped. Am I in a coffee shop? Oh, I'm in a coffee shop called Starbucks. Have I ever been here before? I've been here lots of times. Am I familiar with this neighborhood? I, I know this neighborhood really well, right? So just giving that kind of essence of contextual awareness to, to different apps is a, is a superpower. And you can build really cool next generation services on top of that. And so that's like a, a really amazing developer tool that, um, you know, give people access to. And then, you know, on top of that, there's this kind of this broad understanding the company has of like, well, how are the phones moving through the world? And are they going to Home Depots or are they going to Chipotle's or are they going to malls or are they going to golf courses? And, you know, that's just like a, like an extra layer of intelligence that the platform has. And we can turn that into different types of insights and analytic tools um, that are interesting to a number of the partners and customers of the, of the company. So it was at 50 million at users at its peak. Uh, I, I mean, there was, it depends on your count, right? Yeah. Like when we, we were running those numbers, it's like, you know, you're counting accounts, not like right. the number of, remember this is like many, many years ago. So like the, that's to the point where I, I couldn't tell you how many users there are of the consumer apps just because it's not the metric that we track, right? You, right. You're, you're tracking at this point based on customers and data points and revenue, just a you know, different business, um, that, you know, much different business than it was, you know, 12, 15 years ago. Totally. And the reason why I ask is because, you know, at that peak, it, I mean, Foursquare dominated internet culture for a while, right? Like the idea of being yeah. a mayor of like a Foursquare place. Like I had my first tech story that I got published, or one of my first ones was about this uh, plugin called uh, Couch Cache that, you know, made you seem yeah, like, yeah, you yeah. remember that? It made you seem like you had a cool life by like picking, you picked like a different type of night that you wanted to have an artsy yeah, night yeah. or, a, like, uh-huh. you know, a binge, binge drinking night and <laughs> would like post your Foursquare check-ins through the night to your Twitter followers to show like you were, you were actually having a good time. Like this was like a huge part of internet culture. And it also seems in some ways like that era of the, like it was a more fun era of the internet has passed. Yeah. And obviously like the user numbers, like you've said, we've moved from like maybe 50 to, in the tens. Um, it, it does seem like that, that peak has we've moved beyond it. So you were front and center. You are front and center. I mean, what do you think caused that shift from that? Like more fun and more consumer oriented internet to whatever we have today. That's a great question. Actually, it's a great, a great discussion too. You know, I mean, there was, there was a period, call it, you know, 2009, 2010, when we started and a lot of these other things got started where you're, you're really just making apps for your friends. And that is super fun. And it's like, may the most fun app survive, right? Like that's, that's, that's how it worked. Um, and, you know, as things are starting to grow, you start to get into this race where it's like, okay, all right, you know, Facebook was the biggest thing. And then it was Twitter. And then it's like, well, Instagram's growing and Snapchat's growing. Okay, how are we going to monetize these things? Well, it's going to be advertising, all right? Well, if it's going to be advertising, we're going to get as many users as possible. Just get the numbers up regardless of what you're doing. And so, you know, then you take these products that are kind of niche and small, maybe a couple million users, and you start to, you know, make product changes that make it interesting and accessible and uh, attractive to, you know, tens of millions of users. And in doing so, like, I think part of the, the original product loses some of its soul, right? Like an example of this from Foursquare is like, you know, the, we used to have this inherent bias built in that like independent coffee shops and independent restaurants always trump um, chains, right? But then, you know, a big chain of coffee shops or a big chain of like taco places. But then as you start to do these like advertising deals with them, it's like, well, you can't really talk trash about the big <laughs> chains if they're the ones that are that are, um, you know, helping to pay the company's bills. And you kind of run into this weird thing. Well, well, what are we going to do from a search result perspective? It's the company's opinion that the local taqueria is always better than the the big chain. Well, well, but the big chain is not happy about being, you know, like you you run into those types of issues. And then you start to get into the the weighting of feeds, the algorithmic feeds, right? And, you know, this is like a well-documented thing where I think a lot of people felt that social media started to feel less fun and less relevant and less personal when it was just you showing off what you were doing to all your friends and all your friends responding to it. So like, now you're seeing a bunch of strangers and now you're seeing a bunch of brands and now you're seeing a bunch of influencers and it's all just kind of like performance art. And, you know, it's just like the, 
the the structure and the incentive and the meaning and the why for a lot of the stuff has has just changed over time. And then there's like a whole generation, I think, of like, you know, consumers or users of internet products and internet culture that this is all that they know, right? Like they only know algorithmic feeds. They only know the for you feeds. And this idea of like software that's fun and playful, like it's just not their experience of the internet. Like social media makes you feel bad about yourself. And it's, you know, you're always watching your like count, right? And this, like you describe the the period before that stuff was the norm to people and it's totally foreign. Like they don't remember that. They never participated in that. And, um, you know, that's kind of a period of the internet that I grew up in, right? Like Flickr and Dodgeball and Delicious and Friendster and Foursquare and, you know, early Twitter, right? Before this stuff just got huge and turned into like a part of like the mass culture machine, these were toys, you know, like Chris Dixon has that great quote, like the next big thing starts off looking like a toy. Like we made the toys. There's a lot of us that made toys beginning on. And then those things grew up to be these big platforms that like, you know, they just change over time. And um, anyway, so like when I think about building stuff again, I think about it less from like, a, all right, how do we build the biggest thing possible? And more like, well, how do you make something just like super fun for people? Like, how do you get people back to this point where like they're using something because they, they want to use it, not because it's designed to be addictive, you know, not because we're, you know, engineering dopamine hits into it, but just because like, it's, it's like a fun, enjoyable social experience. Right. And that like brings me to a question, which is, can we change a variable today to get us back to the time where things were fun? Like, is there something that we can change? Is it obviously the pursuit of scale, I think will always be baked in, but is it like a different form of venture capital? Because there's a push and pull here, right? Like if, if, we end up having like fun products that take off again. Like that's still going to be a good business. Maybe it's not like yeah. you know, massive Twitter business, but it's still something that's going to be worth something to people. So there's got to be people want the internet to be fun. There's got to be a void. So I'm just curious if you there. I'm, yeah, I'm curious if you think there's a way to get us back there. And if so, what do we change? Um, well, I think there's lots of like, you know, theses about what, what, what comes next, right? And this is part of the whole Web3 thing, right? It's like, hey, eventually people will, will own their data and own their content and own their feeds and own their following. And maybe they'll monetize that and they'll be able to swap in their own algorithms, you know, complete control and ownership over these, over these platforms. And, um, you know, like I just quoted Chris Dixon. He just wrote a, a book about this. I'm working out of a space called Betaworks. He gave a talk here last week. So this is like time on top, top of oh, mind for me. Yeah. 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 It was, also, it was, it was awesome. Yeah. I mean, well, we, I'm sure we've talked about this on the show before, uh, this, this interview comes out, but he's, he had two reps pitch this, uh, show to come on as a guest and then bailed at the last second. So oh, we're not, I'm sure we're not very a, pro. The, the, yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's busy. I think he, and I mean this, let's just do this aside because it's worthwhile. I think he is generally not interested in taking any questions that could be tough on him. And that's been a big criticism for, for web three is that it's just, like boosters promoting boosters. So like uh, maybe well, this I might have this thing where like we're just dissecting the whole thing. So I saw the yep. total opposite side of that. Okay. Um, you know, maybe it's just kind of preserving it until the book comes out, but who knows? Um, but wait, what were we just talking about? We were talking about if there's a variable that we oh. can change. So, okay. Maybe oh, one oh, three yeah. is one of them, but. Well, well, I don't think it's like a variable, but like, mm -hmm. you know, I feel like I'm, I'm old enough to have remembered a time where I'm like, Yahoo, what could ever be better than Yahoo? And then be like, Alta Vista, what could ever be better than Alta Vista, right? For search engines. Right. And then it's like, MySpace, who, who could ever beat MySpace, right? Like these things that seem like impossible to deconstruct, like they eventually come tumbling down and then new stuff emerges in its place. And, you know, even rewind like three years ago, like how the heck is Google going to come apart? And then you, you, you start to see like, Oh, may maybe we're kind of done with search and we're just always using bots and we're always using LLMs, right? And so you, you can start to see like, maybe there is a changing of the guard that's happening. It's not a variable that you flip or change, like, oh, let's just do this instead of that. But it's just like, you know, maybe the incumbents, this is the part where like they, they just, they can't move quick enough to keep up with new and emerging technologies and they'll steadily be, 
you know, um, you know, up and coming companies, products, services that continue to challenge these things that just seemed like indestructible a couple of years ago. But even if the so technology shift might be one way to do it, but even if the technology shifts, like you still end up with that pressure that you talked about to scale, right? Like we're seeing even in the AI situation where you have these companies like OpenAI, which have like billions of dollars put into them, an $89 billion valuation and those pressures to get big and do it in those ways that make things less fun will inherently come to them. And in fact, their mission of like uh, developing AI responsibly, you know, sort of yeah. gets tested when they have all that money put into them. So just to put a finer point on it, do you think there's a way of funding tech companies, you know, that can help them retain some of that original character that we talked about that just doesn't put these expectations to scale on them? Or is it just a fact of the internet economy that if you don't scale, you will shrink? Yeah. I, well, this is also a kind of, this is a tricky question because like, you know, there's a difference between building like, Hey, I'm going to build a consumer service and I'm going to, you know, try, try to do something on the internet in a new way. And I'm going to get a small team of engineers and maybe I raise a little bit of money or maybe we just bootstrap it, whatever. Like that's, that's one thing. And that's what a lot of us think of when we think about like, Oh, internet companies, internet startups. And then you've got this whole other thing where it's like, if you're doing, you know, um, a lot of this AI work and you're, you, you need dedicated hardware and you need specific chipsets, like, you know, you need to raise a huge war chest in order yeah. to have access to the server farms that can do the stuff that you need to, right? As all these arguments around like, hey, it's going to be really hard to unseat companies like Google and OpenAI Open and Microsoft and um, and Facebook, for example, Meta, just be, because they, like, they have all this infrastructure already. And it may be the case that, you know, he or she who has the best infrastructure is the one that ends up winning this round, right? And and who who knows? But like, you know, when you when you're talking about like fundraising in general, like, hey, to build something like Foursquare, like we built 15 years ago, it's a totally different model. You would need a smaller team. The tools are much better, cheaper, easier, mm -hmm. right? You could probably do with five people what we were doing with ten people back then, right? To build like a cutting edge, uh, you know, AI company. Totally different ball game, totally different model, totally different cost structure. So, you know, I think venture is always, um, you know, it, it, venture exists for a reason to help those companies that need that capital to do those things, get what they need in order to scale up. Right. But then, you know, it's a totally different issue of like, hey, can you still do things, smaller things on the side? And can those still be re relevant, big? Can they still scale? I think that's that's the thing that still remains to be seen. Yeah. And there's one more point about this, which I'm curious to get your take on, which is that, yeah, you have the VCs pushing for scale, but you also have big tech that's copying and sort of if you if you have a good idea and it, it takes some momentum as a standalone product, it's almost like a sure thing that especially if you're a consumer that a Facebook or a Google will eventually just yeah. copy that. And then it goes from, OK, we're scaling, we're gaining momentum to all of a sudden oh my goodness, like Mark Zuckerberg is going to cut off my growth. And then that sort of changes the nature of these things. For instance, you know, you talk about like, like checking in, like, didn't you guys have a yeah. situation where all of a sudden, like Google starts to make reviews and check-ins part of maps and they just have a much bigger yeah. install base. So how, how big of a factor is big tech in terms of, you know, what's happened to the consumer internet? Well, I think it's it's less about, um, I certainly remember the time where it's like, gosh, we're going to get cut off from the feeds, right? They'll throttle the feeds in such a way. And um, I think that's less of a, of a growth thing now than it was. But like this idea of like, hey, can, um, can a bigger company be inspired by the work that a smaller startup does and just say, Hey, you know, I want this to uh, to be in my app, and and therefore I will make your app less relevant or less less special. You know, probably the the most well known version of this is um, you know Instagram uh, reaching into Snapchat and taking the you know the stories format and saying like, well, this is a brand new format. We would like this format in our app. Like, does that undercut their growth? Does it commoditize the category and the products a little bit? Like that. You know, that's, I mean, it happens all the, I think that type of stuff happens all the time. It's probably like the, the most well known or maybe like per, surgical, perfectly executed version of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like how many, how many breakout apps do you, do you see these days? Uh, maybe it's like one or two a year, really. Right. 
I mean, I'm, I'm not as into the scene as I was before, but, um, you know, it used to be like, Hey, there's a new thing to play with every month. Every month. Right. And yeah. And, there, and, and, you know, there still is new stuff to play with every day, every month, but like how much of the stuff really has sticking power. And if something really does get sticking power, does, does the thing that make it interesting and novel, um, just get sucked into some other, some other product in a way that like, you know, hinders it or makes it less special. Like I think, you know, that, that is, that's still a real thing. Um, that said, like, you know, it's not, stopping people that I know from continuing to build things. Like people aren't like, Oh shucks. It's not even worth doing a startup because Facebook's <laughs> right. just going well, to copy it. Like, yeah, no people are, you know, like there's a certain class of people that are just like, you know, I, I like to build things. I need to, I have an idea. I cannot sleep at night until I see this thing exist. I will go make this thing. That is the thing that makes me happy is building this thing. And you know, that's, I think that's how new stuff gets pushed in the world is people just brute force, through all of these, you know, um, hypothetical reasons not to do it. Last question about this. There was a meme that went around a couple of weeks ago about how like basically consumer VC is done for. What do you think about that? Um, I don't think it's done for, like, I mean, I get, I see, I see deals all the time. People are always pitching me stuff. People are still fundraising. There's still funds that do this, you know, um, people going out raising fifty million dollars to build a consumer app that doesn't have like runaway traction. Yeah, sure, those days are long gone. Um, does that mean that there will never be another hit consumer not app? Like, absolutely not. Are people much more wary to take a bet on one? Yeah, absolutely so. Um, but you know, it's just people being more selective. There's probably a lot less money to go around, and there's a you know, people are much uh, more cautious about where they place their bets, but I don't think it's totally gone. Right. Okay. Let's talk about a bet that you're making and let's just go full <laughs> circle here because a couple of weeks ago uh, you threaded. I, I love your threads feed, by the way. It's great. Um, Appreciate that. Yeah. No, it's real fun. I feel like, are you more active there than you were on Twitter? I'm done with Twitter. Yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I gave up on it a couple mm -hmm. months ago. Yeah, so I, I I do enjoy the stuff that you put out there. Great video of, um, we all talk about of Steve Jobs calling uh, virtual reality like headphones for video. But but yeah, um, yeah. more to the point, you said, I'm working on a new project. It's an app. I'm walking around NYC today testing it. And one of those, uh, and it's one of the things that uh, just, just pushed me, made me uh, LOL. That is a great feeling as a builder. That is all. And then you gave like the threads hashtag, make the internet fun again. So, you know, we've been, we spent like 20 minutes or talking about how could the internet be fun? Do people want to build consumer apps? How do you scale them? You have like, by nature of what you're building, an answer here. So actually, for listeners, I have no idea what uh, Dennis is building. And I think you're going to talk about it in public for either the first time or one of the first times now. Um, but what I've heard is that you might have gotten like a band of like the old Foursquare folks back together and are trying to build something not exactly the same, but in, in that nature. So <laughs> well, how do those rumors compare to reality and what, what's going on? Well, a couple, a couple of things. First of all, like, I, I just, I like to build things, right? Like I, since leaving Foursquare, I've tried to do less building and more like, you know, ad, like more company building than product building uh, and advising, right? Because that's kind of what I was, was doing for a while. But like, I, I do like to build stuff. And, um, you know, my last gig at Foursquare was running the R&D lab there. I just, you know, the mandate was take the tools and technology, take all the stuff we've made at Foursquare over the years and like make cool stuff with it, like build cool things. And we, we had made like my favorite thing at Foursquare I think we ever made was this project called um, uh, um, Marsbot for AirPods. And it was like a, a city guide for AirPods. And you would just walk around and it would tell you stuff about the city. And, you know, like we, we were working on it in 2019. I wrote a big blog post about it. We were set to launch it at South by Southwest in 2020 and then COVID, mm -hmm. right? And that's like, well, that, I mean, no one's walking around. No one's doing anything. That project just kind of went back on the shelf. And then, you know, I ended up leaving the company like a, a year later. And, and I think the project has been turned off and the app has been removed from the store. And, you know, that's like the... I, I love that product. And so, um, you know, like w one of the things I'm working on now is like a, a sequel to that, basically. It's like, okay, like this, you put your AirPods in, you walk around, it tells you interesting things that are happening about the city, right? That, that old project that we had, I mean, this is back in 2019, 
you know, we had whatever, you know, a couple thousand users of it. Um, and, you know, we were starting to get interesting feedback. It wasn't, it didn't reach any scale, right? But like there was enough there to be like, there's something really interesting here. And that's what we're trying to do with this new version. Um, the thing that we, we have now, yes, there's like a, it's like we're in the stage where it's not, it's like not a company, it's not a mm -hmm. product. It's like a, it's a project, right? It's a project I'm working on with a couple, you know, a couple of folks that worked at Foursquare many, many moons ago also. And it's called, right now it's called Bebot, um, which is like what my son uh, used to, instead of saying robot, he would say Bebot. And so it's like, you know, it has like a robot voice and it talks to you. But I you know before we jumped on the pod, um, I was in the Lower East Side of New York and, you know, I walked all the way over here. It took me about a half an hour. And as I'm walking through the Lower East Side in Soho and um, the West Village, it, it's popping up and it's telling me about like, oh, this place is interesting and this is this place is new and this is why this is something that's cool going on here. Um, and so, you know, it's really an exploration of, you know, of um, use like an audio first experience that's built around cities. And so sometimes I think of it almost like a, a version of, of ways, but for people that walk around, right? Like what, what's happening around me? What should I be, what should I know about? What should I not know about? What should I, what should I stay away from? What should I flock towards? Um, and so like the, these are the things, like I, I love this, this space, like this idea of like you build things for your friends in cities that help them have a better experience in the cities, but are also just kind of like a little bit fun and a little bit weird. And so, you know, we have like 50 people, testing it now. Um, most of them are in, are in New York, right? The feedback is like, it kind of works, but it kind of doesn't. This thing's kind of funny. This thing's really annoying. This thing didn't work. Here's an unexpected bug. So we're in that point where like, we're at that stage where it's like, we're, we're just trying to tune it so it works better. And then you can start to layer like the fun and whimsical and weird stuff on top of it. And I feel like that's kind of like my, my bread and butter. That's the stuff that I love to do. Yeah. So hearing you talk about it, it's not like an audio tour. It's like, not like a, this yeah, is yeah, a history. It, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I should have clarified that. Like it's, it's, um, you know, I always thought of like, um, audio as like poor man's augmented reality, right? Everyone <laughs> wants to wear the glasses yeah. and see this and see the post-it notes, the virtual post-it notes, like, I've seen the glasses. I've tried the glasses. Those glasses aren't happening anytime soon. But if you want to play in that space, like, okay, let's just play with it with audio. Like, I'm wearing these things now. I've been wearing them for the last, like, two hours. Um, like, this this works. And, like, you know, we were able to tune this enough where it's like you can be on a corner and it's like, you know, look up. And you're like, you look up. And it's like, let me tell you about the thing you're looking at. There's no camera in it. You can just do that with the compass, the accelerometer, with motion, with GPS. Right, like we're building the thing that we're building. It's built on top of the Foursquare API and the SDK, the movement, the Pilgrim SDK, which is now called the Movement SDK. Like, it's it's like the same tech stack, and it's like the same vibe. It's just like you know, in a in a different state now. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's like this is the stuff I kind of love love building. Yeah, it sounds great. So it will point out like if I'm getting it right, historic places, but also like cool buildings, interesting architecture, maybe event spaces or Restaurants. A little bit of anything. Like I think of it as like a platform for contextual aware notifications. Cool. Right. Like it. Um, you know, when people say notifications, you think of like, oh, I get push messages on my phone with like the headlines from the New York Times, right? And it's like, yeah, like that. That I feel like there's so much stuff on your phone that's meant to distract you. That's meant to like, like command your attention you know like i get a notification it's like whoa why don't you disappear into the phone for a couple minutes instead of being in the real world and what i want to do is kind of build a notifications platform that is respectful of your attention like we're not here to distract you we're not here to pull you into the internet we are here to augment your experience of of the real world um and like i feel like th this is like this is what we were trying to do at Foursquare in 2013, you know, before things like Instagram and Snap got so big and people just got lost in endlessly scrolling, you know, feeds and dopamine hits of, of likes and, and all. And it's like, it, I have this whole thesis about like this, this internet that, that I wanted to exist 2009, 10, 11, 12, 13, building Foursquare, building this tech, like that, that internet never happened. It's over here in Bizarro world. Mm -hmm. And like the internet we got is the one that's like, you can just sit and scroll forever. The algorithm will keep giving you stuff. 
Spend more time looking at the, gra uh, the glass. Spend more time in the feed, right? It, remove yourself from the real world. And it's just like, I get it. That's big. There's a huge ad model behind it. People are making tons of money off that. It's just like, it's just never been the thing that I'm like passionate about. Like I, my whole career has been build software for the streets, right? Stuff that helps people pay attention to the real world. And like, I think what I'm trying to do now at this stage of my career is go back to that moment in time, like 2013, where I feel like Foursquare had a lot of the stuff right. We just, we just weren't big enough to make the thing happen. And I want to go back to that and like build the things that like I think should have existed or that should exist in the world. And it starts with this thing, you know, this Bebot thing that we're working on now. Yeah. And then so where does the uh, information that it pulls from come from? Like when it finds uh, a place a that you're interested of, in, yeah. you might be interested in. It hits it, a lot of it comes from Foursquare right now. Like the content isn't isn't great. This is something I gotta I gotta like. It's on my list of things to fix. I remember I was mm -hmm. like sending some Slack messages before we jumped on the call. I was like, okay, we got a problem with content. I just <laughs> took a long walk and the content's yeah. all screwed up. And here's how to fix it. But it's a, it's a little bit of Foursquare stuff. It's a, a little bit of OpenAI. Right. Oh. Hey, we found something interesting. Give give a prompt to OpenAI, and then OpenAI is like, "Let me tell you something magical about this place." But like, you know, OpenAI has just got the wrong vibe. It's not that it it does its job, but like, I don't I don't like the job that it's doing. Um, and then some of it is user generated, right? Just people are leaving content, and then some of it is being imported from third parties. Like, you send a little bot out in the internet. It's like, tell me what find the interesting things that are happening in this neighborhood and then bring them into our ecosystem so that we can relay them out to people. So there could um, also be like events like, Hey, there's, you know, just so you know, there's going to be an open air concert going on in this field on Thursday. It, it can be, it can be anything. Wow. Yeah. It Ooh. can be a little nugget of tri trivia. It could be like a, a daily affirmation. It could be pointing out a street artist. It could be point, pointing out like uh, this, something's going to happen here in the future. Something happened here last night. Someone just walked by five minutes ago. Um, and so really it's just like, think of it as like a, a platform for delivering these types of like, uh, respectful notifications. Um, you know, and, but, you know, in addition to building the platform, we're also, you know, um, you know, filling it with content at the moment. Yeah. And so it's going to be audio format. Let's say I'm listening to a podcast. Will it kind of jump in and be like, Hey, by the way, or would I have to have like no audio on otherwise? Yeah. If you're listening to a podcast, it will pause it. And then it will say it's thing. And, and, you know, the thing is meant to be like 10 syllables. Like it's okay. short, you know, it's not yep. like, let me give you a 30 second monologue. It's like, here's one sentence, two sentences. We're done. I'm going to go back to your podcast. If you're listening to music, it will lower the volume a little bit. Um, if you're on the phone or doing a video call, it won't interrupt you. It just kind of goes to sleep. Um, you know, but it's, it's meant to be, it's meant to be very light. Like you might go on a walk, you might hear nothing. You know, you might go on a walk, you might hear three things, right? But it's not it's not meant to be overwhelming, right? Like it's important. I, I think it's important to kind of note, like we, I feel like the world is trying to get into this, this, um, this like agentic state, right? Where it's like, um, there's, there's software that is, that is looking out and doing tasks for you on your behalf. But that, that like, we don't live in that world. We live in a world where these things dominate all of our attention. Right. And all of the things that we address by name, Siri and Google and Alexa, like they are Siri's going off. Right. Th <laughs> those are are creatures that you rub the magic lamp. Hey, Siri. And Siri comes out. It's like, no, 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 no. We're not doing that. We are doing the opposite. This is like an angel or devil that sits on your shoulder and it yeah. taps you. And it's like, hey, I, I know you're walking somewhere really fast. You got you're really busy. You got shit going on. But let me just tell you about something I think you're going to like. Right. And so it's kind of flipping the agentic model around. Right. I'm not asking the genie to come out of the lamp. Like this is the thing that is like proactively giving me a little nugget of info um, that is supposed to make my day a little brighter or to make you smile. Right. Like that, that thing, like I've been kind of under wraps about this, but like when, when I was walking down the street the other day and I passed a piece of content, it literally made me like laugh out loud. And I was like, like we're, we got it. This, this is, this is a thing, right? It's a moment where you're like, okay, this is not a, this, this is a project, but this will be a product and it will be a good product because it can make you do that thing. Like it can make you feel that way. Even when it's in this like really like basic shitty, barely working state. Yeah. All right. Two more questions for you about it. Then we can move on. First of all, yeah, um, yeah. we had talked about this before, before you basically released it to a handful of people. 
and then while you were testing mm -hmm. it and you were very interested in getting some uh, feedback from the testing. So what have you learned so far? Yeah. Um, well, I wanted to, um, sorry, we, we punted the date of the podcast because yeah. I wanted to like, I just wanted some confidence that mm -hmm. like, A, does it work at scale? And 50 people is not scale, but like, okay, you put it on people's phones, they're walking around, they're hearing stuff, like they're, they don't hate it, right? They give me feedback. It's like, it's fine. It's not great. I'm like, I can live with that feedback, but technically it works. Um, it works. Um, it works well in some places. It it works okay in other places. It's not crashing people's phones. It's not making people sick. It's not totally annoying people. You know, it's like okay, we got a we got a good a good thing here. Um, and then also like you know the, the first is like d does it even work? Like can can we get it to work? And then the second thing is like like is it is it fun? Like is it worth is is it is it worth doing? Is it worth trying to do it at a larger scale? And, you know, yes, the feedback I've gotten from some people is, well, from folks are like, yeah, there's something here that like, it, you know, you do it right, it could be delightful, which is really kind of where, you know, my high bar for it. But then, you know, my, me walking down the street, having my own experience of like, okay, I, I get it. I had that moment. I have that confidence. But like, I think in that, in that, um, in that thread that you had mentioned, I should put that in the show notes because I think there's yeah, like yeah. a little mini thing there. Right. But like I had mentioned like this idea of like, like founder self-doubt. Like I build lots of stuff and people like seek my opinion out all the time for how to build stuff. But like I am still like, I don't know. Can I still do this? Is this any good? Like should I be doing this? Should I just go get another job, do something else? But, you know, you, you have to – I think sometimes you have to have that moment where you're like, okay, I, I, it gave me the – the boost of confidence that like, yeah, yeah, th this is, this is the thing. This is what we do. Now we talk about it. Then we build it and we keep doing it. You know, it's just, I just kind of needed that shot in the arm. Okay. And then when it comes, we spoke for a, a good chunk of today also about the push to scale and how that can sort of make a fun product, not fun. Um, so how are, how do you think, I mean, obviously we're, we're so <laughs> early on here, right? So it's kind of comical to be asking a question like this, but Let's say it does, you know, get to this point. Like, are, how are you going to avoid those pitfalls that we discussed? Um, I don't know. <laughs> you know, like yeah. my, my my job right now is like make a thing that works, make a thing that people like, make a field delightful and fun, mm -hmm. um, and then figure out how to turn it into turn it into a business, right? Like, what, do I want to do uh, like an ad in data business again? No, I am not hungry to do that at all. Could I make it a subscription project product? Absolutely. Um, you know, could could there be you know some sponsored content in there, right? Where you know people are are you know brands are creating content and scattering them around. Like it's kind of like the stuff we did in early Foursquare. Sure, right? Do I have to raise a hundred million dollars to build this thing? No. That's Can I good. make it work yeah. with a smaller with a smaller team and kind of like a scrappier business model and maybe like some subscription and sponsorship revenue up front? Maybe, possibly, right? So let's let's just try that. Right. Um, and then, of course, I mean, like I I'm drinking like the the Web three Kool Aid a little bit. I don't want to say like NFTs and crypto, but this idea that like, um, you know, hey, there's there's uh, opportunity for people to, to own their content. There's opportunity for people to monetize on those platforms. Like, I I, I um, like I'm hopeful about that stage of the internet. And, you know, I want to build, not, not just this, I mean, I have a couple of things I want to build um, that, you know, I think that I hope will have the opportunity to participate in that ecosystem when, you know, m my own products are mature and that ecosystem is, is mature. Okay. And is there a link or, a, I mean, I, if you give me a link, I'll link it in the show notes, but is there like a URL people can go to sign up to a wait list? No, no. Okay. <laughs> there, there's a URL, but it's like, you know, Google form, blah, okay. blah, 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 blah. So I will give you the link, to great. It, but it, I, it's not like go to this website. So, yeah. Okay. Not, great. Yeah. That's a good idea though. That's, I should do that. <laughs> All right. Well, well, if you give us a link and you want people on the wait list, we will, we will link it. All right. Let's yeah, take, uh, I will. I'm right at the show. I'll do this and you can put it in the show notes. So. Okay, sweet. All right. Well, we'll take a quick break and then we'll talk a little bit more about this web three thing. Cause we have differing opinions on that and we should tease that out. And then also maybe a little AI and VR, and then we'll head out. All right, back right after this with Dennis Crowley. And we're back here on Big Technology Podcast with Dennis Crowley. He's the co-founder, former CEO of Foursquare, founder of Bebot. You heard it here first. All right, so let's talk about, <laughs> about Web3. 
The thing about Web3 that that always, outside of all the scam coins and all that stuff, I'm, Aaron Levy was here a, a couple of years ago talking about Web3. We did a Web3 episode. And his main criticism was that if you build for people with a financial stake in something, you're also going to... Um, you're going to build something different than people who just want to use it as a user. And it's very difficult to build for those two different stakeholders in a way that's coherent. So you mentioned yeah. it. I mean, in the first half, you were uh, drinking the Web3 Kool-Aid. You're a builder of, of products, consumer products. So how do you manage that tension? Yeah, I, I, I don't know, right? Because I've never built something in this, in this right. space before. And I should know, like, I, I don't, I don't fashion myself a, like a Web3 innovator, you know, like, I don't mm -hmm. expect to be the one that's inventing stuff in the space. Um, I like to sit back and watch what other people are doing and then be like, hey, is that something that would be applicable to what we're doing? Uh, maybe, right? Maybe in a year from now or two years from now or something. Um, you know, I've worked on a, on a bunch of projects over the last couple of years and and, you know, some of them are like Web3 adjacent, but like we, I never found like the real, like it just ne it never worked. It never, it never worked in a way that wasn't forced, right? And that's not to say that it can't work. It's just to say like, it just, it doesn't work right now, right? And so I'm, I'm kind of like, I'm hopeful and like, um, uh, I'm optimistic about like what people position as like the next phase of the internet. And then like, you know, I think I'm still wrapping, wrapping my head around all the nuances of it. But, you know, I'm, I'm more like Web3 curious in a sense of like, yeah. I see what's going on here. I appreciate the people that are building. I certainly recognize all the nonsense and scams that have happened. And I don't want to put all my chips in that pile. But like, I kind of cautiously look at that as like, that's a space I'd like to play in, like when and if that's mature enough to play in. Another thing that you talked about was that open AI had, just, let's just shift to AI. I think that like, we could probably debate yeah. Web3, but it is interesting to hear your perspective on it. But on the AI front, um, you said open, open AI's vibe wasn't exactly what you were looking for. Now, maybe for that particular product, but what do you think about what can be built on top of these things and why wasn't that vibe right for you? Well, when I say the vibe wasn't right, I mean like the, the prompts, right? right? Like we're doing some basic prompt engineering and, and um, you know, I'm really like I, I, um, the products I've built in the past have a lot of personality built into them, right? Foursquare was very snarky. Dodgeball had mm -hmm. a real opinion about the world. Um, and so I'm trying to like have open AI. I'm trying to define a personality so open AI can give me content that I feel like is like on brand for this thing that we're making. And I just haven't successfully done it yet. And so I don't mean open AI's vibe as a company. Right. Oh, as okay. well. I mean, like my prompt engineering is crappy and I'm just kind of like, I don't want to do any more prompt engineering. I'd rather spend my time doing other stuff. Right. Um, you know, that, that said, like, you know, it's pretty clear, like, like this set of tools that exist are pretty freaking powerful. And it's like, it really does foreshadow, I think what the next stage of the internet is going to, is going to be, you know, I, 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 I posted something on threads, like, I don't know, a, a week ago about how like theory is almost an advertisement for how bad all of this stuff was or how hopeless it all was before LLMs existed, right? If mm -hmm. you try to use Siri now, like after you've been using oh, yes. like chat GTP all day, you're like, this is a baby's toy, you know? But it's like, I mean, you really want, like I want the Siri that's connected to the thing that's really intelligent. You know what I just got? Um, gosh, I didn't know I'm allowed to talk about this. Um, there's, a, there's a toy called Curio that they're yeah. selling, like you can buy it. And it's a, it's a, a child, like a children's plush toy that has like a little device in it. And the device is like a, a local LLM, right? It's connected to the network. I don't know if it's local or not. Really? But like, you know, the, the kids can talk to it. Hey, how's your day? And things like, my day was great. How was yours? Oh, it was great. Can you tell me about electricity? Sure I can. You know, and I, I have this toy. I haven't given it to my kids yet. I, mm -hmm. I took it out of the package and I set it up and I was testing it. And I was like, man, this is like the future of toys. Why, why would, why would you not want a toy that you can talk to? It's like straight out of toy story. Right. Um, but just like that, just, you know, occasionally you're playing with this stuff and you get a glimpse of like what the future is going to be. And you're like, that's kind of pretty cool. But then of course you get the glimpse of like the future is awful with like deep fakes and chat GDP yeah. lying to you and just making shit up. Right. Like, you know, the, the future is, is full of disaster and peril also. Um, 
but I mean, it's hard to look at a lot of these tools and not be kind of inspired for where this stuff is going. Do you? So you said you have lots. I, of I don't people. even know if I answered your question. No, that was a good what, answer. What were you, saying? You, had, you said you had a lot of okay. uh, people that bring you um, bring you deals, and you've seen lots of consumer products. We're always like looking for like what type of products can exist with this stuff outside of like the Chat GPT big models. Are you seeing anything that's catching your attention outside of this toy? I see. Well, I see a lot of like consumer stuff. I see. Mm. I see a lot of city guides. Like I see every city guide product that's out there. People bring it to me, and like I, I just know the space really well. I'm a little bit like jaded on the space. Like I, I see yeah. a lot of things that are very interesting, but like it's really hard to get like a breakout app in that, um, in that space. I definitely have seen people um, experimenting with like chatbots and LLM stuff with city guides, right? Which I think is is also interesting, but kind of hard to do. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm most interested in like folks that are kind of like reinventing a category, you know, like when we talked about the B-Bot stuff and this might just be my own bias, but like, I feel like we're, we're doing this, we're, we're kind of in the space where it's like, I'm not making something that looks like something else. We're making something totally random. Mm -hmm. Right. And in that way, yeah. it's like, it's weird and people don't really get it. And it's kind of, some people kind of think it's kind of stupid and that's great. That's, that's like the space I, I like to operate in. Um, you know, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I haven't like I haven't stopped where I've just been like, this is so good, take take my money. Right. Um, I haven't really? seen anything like that. Recently. You haven't yeah. seen that not, yet. Well, I mean, I, I'm not seeing that. So there's tons of deals out there. Yeah. I I don't see right. 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 But I, a good data I, point, I do. Though. I see. Yeah. I, I mean, I see a lot of consumer stuff, and I I see I I, mean, I have a full empathy for how hard it is to have like a, a breakout hit in that in that space. It's really hard to do. Um, you know, any meaningful user acquisition. So last question about uh, the AI stuff. We just had Gruber on for a very long episode talking about like Apple and uh, their, their pursuit of AI was a very interesting mm -hmm. part of that conversation. <clears throat> and I'm curious, like, so you brought up Siri and how bad it is. Uh, do you, let's say you put your like at product hat on for Apple. Like what could they do with this stuff? Because they are going to do something. Apparently it's coming at WWDC. Yeah, I'm sure it's just like a, you know, a much more conversational version of Siri. You know, like my, my experience with Siri is it just like, it just doesn't, doesn't work mm -hmm. um, a lot of times. And it like, it, it can hold a conversation It loses the, the connection with the conversation. It, you know, it's just, it's just not, it's just not great. Um, and I, and I think what we've seen is like the beginning of what great looks like. Um you know, that toy I was talking about for my kids. I was like, this is, this is pretty cool, right? I'm conversing with a thing that's not alive, right? Yeah. In a way that is far superior than Alexa and, you know, Google Home and, and Siri. Wait, what's is, this that's, toy called? That's me. Curio? Uh, Curio. Yeah, I think it's, mm. it's, what's the website? HeyCurio.com? I got to get one of these. It's, it's, it's rad. Yeah. Um, a, a buddy mm. of mine showed me their Instagram and I went and, and ordered one. Cool. Um, Let's see. Where's oh yeah, um, hey, dot com. Oh no, I just lost your window when I did that. Oh, here you are. Yeah. Um, so let, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So I, that that's what I would hope it would it it would be. You know, just like a version of Siri that works as well as ChatGTP does, but just can access all the stuff on my phone. Okay. Uh, last question for you. Uh, you and we mentioned in the first half. You put this uh, video up on on your feed of Steve Jobs <clears> talking <throat> about how. Basically, headphones are amazing because it's like having a speaker there with you at all times. But we don't have what do you call it? Video head headphones for video, where you could put yeah. on headphones mm -hmm. and all of a sudden and watch a video. And that's obviously what Apple has just created. Uh, yeah. Where do, you, where do you do you see this as something that really can develop into what they hope, or not? Um, I think everyone wants the Vision Pro to be the augmented reality hardware of the future. I right. see mm -hmm. all these people wearing it outside as if it's you have like seen AR people glasses. outside with it, huh? That's becoming. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen. I've seen <laughs> no, it on the Instagram videos. and I'm just yeah. like, yeah, I'm like, look, look at these funny. people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's that, you know, I think people, people want that, right? They, they, they want that future to exist. They, they want this to be the product. Like my, my, you know, the data points that I have on it is like, this is like, it's a, it's a really nice big screen that you wear on your face. You're watching, you know, Star Wars on your couch is the best screen. Holy cow, it's in 3D too. You know, like you're you're working on your computer. Well, I have 50 monitors in front of me. I can do anything I want. Um, you know, I, I saw something 
as someone had suggested, like, hey, even if you look at the way it's priced, it's like a, a, a mid-tier, you know, um, really fancy screen. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with, I, I, I believe that's probably what it's going to be for the, you know, for the short term until it either gets smaller or lighter or cheaper or like really amazing games emerge for it. Um, Did you buy one? But yeah, no. Okay. I've Why played not? With it. I, I feel like you would, you would be someone who would buy one. I think I think there was a, a younger version of myself that was like really into it. But I also yeah. like you know, I have two two of the Oculus Quest, right? One for me, right. one for my wife. And it's like I was an aspirational user. I'm like, we're gonna use this all the time, we're gonna go on date nights in <laughs> VR during COVID, yeah. right? And we just I mean, I've got three kids, right? Like they, they, they I just don't I, it's just not part of like our our household and our lifestyle at the moment. Although probably, I can tell you the moment, hold yeah. on, the moment my, <laughs> I was charging my Oculus once and yep. my son, I think he was like four at the time and he came, he came into the room and he saw it charging and he picked it up and he's like, what is this? <laughs> it's a TV you put on your face. And he was just like, how, how have you been keeping this from me? Oh my God. And I was like, do, 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 do. You don't want him in there. to see what they are into. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, Dennis, this is great. Thank you so much for joining. Yeah, this is this was super fun. Thank you for having me on the show. And uh, uh, yeah, like I'll come back in the future and we'll talk about Bebot and all the other stuff that it does and can do. So that would be great. Hopefully I can get a chance to test it. So walking around awesome. New York will be cool. All right, man. Thanks again. <laughs> All right, dude, I'll see you in a bit. Yeah, you. thanks. All right, yeah. everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll be back on Friday with a new show, Breaking Down the News. And we'll see you next time on Big Technology Podcast.